Hi, I'm Michael Jones. I'm one of the pastor teachers at the Orange Free Church of Christ in Orange County, California. Our congregations have been affected by the coronavirus, just like everybody else in the world, and we've been requested to practice social isolation. So while we're doing that, we're not able to assemble collectively, so we prepare these daily video devotionals to our members as well as anyone else who might find use for them. Uh, because we've been asked to do the social isolation, I do broadcast each day from a different isolated location. And today I'm broadcasting from Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, I want to read for you this morning a passage out of Romans chapter 12 where the Apostle Paul says this in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So a well-known sweepstakes offer that arrives in the mail is from the Publisher's Clearinghouse, but they're not the only guys who do one. Magazine companies like Reader's Digest, Good Housekeeping, and others also do these uh, sweepstake events where they mail these things to your home with usually a banner on the front of the envelope that says, you could already be a winner. All you got to do is fill out the paperwork and send it back and who knows what will happen. Apparently, those are very successful. Magazine sales go up by about one and a half million subscribers, so it's an effective way for marketing. In 1997, the American Family Publishers had a mailing list that included a church on it, the Bushnell Assembly of God from Bushnell, Florida. The computer somehow twisted around the name of the church so that the sweepstakes notice was addressed to God of Bushnell and was sent to the church's address. The letter read this, Dear God, we're searching for you. You've been positively identified as our $11 million mystery millionaire. What an incredible fortune there would be for God. Imagine the looks you would get from your neighbors. But don't just sit there, God. Come forward now and claim your prize. They were searching for God. They promised God a huge blessing, but only if he would respond to their offer. In Romans chapter 12, what Paul is telling us is that God has made us a huge offer as well. We can know the will of God, but it's conditioned as well. We're told that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And by doing so, we will discern what is the will of God. Now, who wouldn't want to know the will of God for their life? Would you want to know the will of God for your life? I suspect that of course you would. So if you're searching for God's will and you want to receive his blessings, you need to respond to his offer. And his offer is, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There was a market research group called Barna that did a survey of a large sampling of Americans about 20 years ago. This is a spiritually oriented uh, sampling and survey company, so they were focusing in on church people. And what they found is that people are most likely to make their moral and ethical decisions on the basis of whatever feels right or comfortable in any given situation. In other words, if people think something is right, or they feel something is right, then it must be right. Well, that's a terrible indicator. What you feel is right may or may not be right. There needs to be some objective standard of truth by which we can judge what is right and what is wrong. I once read a story about a wealthy man who had a collection of paintings, and one of them was the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It hung over a writing desk. One day he noticed that the painting was hanging crooked, so he straightened it. The next morning he noticed it was crooked again, so he straightened it again. And that happened every morning for about four or five consecutive days. Finally, in frustration, he asked the housekeeper if she had any idea of what was happening. The housekeeper answered back, Sure, that was me. I have to hang it a little crooked to make sure the tower is straight. It made sense to her but it wasn't right for the tower to lean like that, so she felt she had to make it a little bit crooked so it would look straight. The Bible tells us that there is a kind of default thinking that people fall into, the way of the world, the culture that is around us. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. A little bit later, in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, the proverb writer says, there is a way that seems right to a man. In other words, makes sense to me, but the end of which is the way of death. Proverbs 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Now, why would trusting in your own instincts make you a fool? Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 might give us the answer. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? There's something wrong inside of us, and that something causes us to make bad choices. And what is wrong with our heart is that it has been tainted by sin, and our world has warped our way of thinking to where we often think that society's norm is acceptable before God. It usually isn't. That's why the Christian life is a countercultural life. I had a problem with my computer recently, my little notebook computer. I turned it on and I noticed that the time was off. It was off by about three hours. It would say that it was two o'clock when it was actually five o'clock. The problem, turns out, is that the computer would connect to the internet to sync to the atomic clock, and the settings to do that had been switched off. So it wasn't syncing with the standard that established the actual time. If the switch was turned off, the computer didn't get the feedback from the official world clock over the internet, and as a result, it kept telling me that it was 2 o'clock, when it was actually 5 o'clock. That computer went on its merry little way with the wrong time all day long until I switched the switch back on. There's a sense in which our spiritual life is kind of the same way. We have to sync it up with something. We either sync it up with the world or we sync it up with the Lord. If we sync it up with the world, it's probably going to be wrong. If we sync it up with the Lord, it will never be wrong. God's thinking is different than ours. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord's. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what we need to do is make sure that we're constantly connected to God so that we're receiving the right information that keeps us in sync with the way it is it should be. Now, how do we do that? We do that through the scripture. The word of God reveals to us the thoughts of God. Scripture will not just come into our head through osmosis. Owning a Bible will not get it into your heart. You have to actually take it in through reading, either by reading or perhaps maybe through listening to it. I oftentimes listen to Scripture in addition to reading it when I do my PT and workouts and such. Perhaps that would work for you. Or when you're commuting in your car, maybe that would work for you. Whatever works for you, do something to expose yourself to the Word of God. There was a study done recently that discovered something called the power of four. What they found is that to be actually influenced in a positive direction, you need to be exposed to Scripture about four times in a relatively short period of time. Here's what the study discovered. If the only time you were exposed to a passage was just during a church service, say the preacher or a Bible teacher says, turn to this passage, you turn to it and read it, turns out if that's your only exposure, it will have little or no effect on how most people think or behave. On Monday, if the person says, you know, I think I'll look at that passage again, and they open it up and see it the second time in a row, it still has little effect on most people's behavior or thinking. If they expose themselves to it again on Tuesday, now a little discernment starts to initiate change. And then the study showed that if you opened your Bible the fourth time and began to read it again, it would now have a dramatic effect on how you deal with your life, how you handle loneliness, moral struggles, how you share your faith with others. The study concluded with this finding that's very poignant. The lives of Christians who do not engage the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of non-believers. In other words, God's Word will not change us if you don't read it. That's why the Bible advises us in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. We need to take in the scripture and allow it to have its transforming effect on our mind. Well, Psalm 111 and verse 10 says that wisdom begins with the fear of God. One thing that the fear of God means is that we acknowledge God is always right. 
There's an adage that says, if the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. That phrase gets ridiculed a lot, but the reality is, it's true. I can be wrong, but God can never be wrong. If I fear God and embrace His agenda and allow His priorities to be at the top of my list, then I'm going to be going off in the right direction. On the other hand, if I let my priorities take first place, I might get off course, and that would be a terribly disastrous way to lead my life. In Romans 10 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, some people take that passage to think that if we confess Jesus as Lord, that's like an incantation. It's like casting a spell. All we have to do is say, Jesus is Lord. But that's not what that is. To confess Jesus as Lord has meaning. It means that we install him as Lord in our life. We acknowledge that he owns me. He not only owns my possession, he owns me. If I have a renewal of my mind, it means I've turned over my thinking to the Lord. I've placed his priorities over my priorities. There's a well-known story about a wealthy rancher who died and left a will that not only included his sons would receive an inheritance, but also included instructions of things that he expected to be done with the ranch he was leaving to them. First, he instructed them to buy some extra land that bordered their property. The two boys receiving the inheritance talked it over and said, you know, dad's right. That's exactly what we should do. And so they did. The next instruction that he left is that they should dam up a creek with a pond so that the cattle would have enough water to, to graze with um, as they grazed nearby. And the sons were impressed by the father's decision. And so, again, they promptly dammed up the creek and created the pond just as dad had said. Lastly, he wrote that they should tear down the old barn and build a new one in its place. The boys talked about that and said, you know, I don't think we need to do that. That old barn is still useful. So they left the barn standing. Now, did his sons obey their father's instructions? Most people would say they obeyed two out of the three things he wanted done, but in reality, they didn't obey any of their father's wishes. They simply obeyed his instructions if they agreed with them. They viewed their father's commands as suggestions. There are people that do that with God. They only obey God if they agree with him. If the Bible says something that they are uncomfortable with, they ignore it. They treat God's written word as if they are suggestions that can be ignored at will. They're not. That's not the way we approach scripture. Romans 12.2 says that we must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that will only happen if you saturate your mind with the things of God and you go beyond merely knowing what God's Word says, but implement it and actually do what God's Word says. Well, as you spend time in the Scripture today and in your walk with the Lord, allow God's Word to have its transforming effect in your life that you too might become more and more of the person God wants you to be. Well, I hope our time in the Scripture today has been helpful and useful to you. I'll be back again tomorrow with another message from a different part of God's Word and from a different isolated location.